I don't know if I'm going to do any better today, but it seems like God is, you know, I, I've never really been what you'd call a Holy Ghost preacher. You know, the guys that kind of whip things up and all that, but I, it seems like I'm running in that direction. I don't know. <laughs> but God, whatever you want to do, that's fine with me. Amen? Amen. So, so uh, and beginning, you know, I've been teaching, teaching, teaching for three years now, and, and, uh, and Along the line, I've also been praying, Lord, when are you going to pour out the, you know, turn up the heat, pour out your spirit? I want to see some things happening here because I've I've been in and been a part of some very powerful move of God. Where I mean, people, we've been in services, people get healed just worshiping. I, I've been in services where people can't wait to get to the altar; they mess up your service, and they they want to. Preacher, I want to get saved now. Don't wait till the end. Amen. I, I, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen the glory cloud of God appear in services. And I've been saying for, well, not all the time, but for a good portion of the last three years, I've been saying, God, where is that? And he kept telling me, you got to get it in them first. You got to get it in them first. You know, get the word of God into people. And, and then, uh, so now, God's beginning to release things. Amen. So, uh, we're going to get as far as we can today. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. So, Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, Lord, most of all for your presence. Lord, we desire that you would move in and among your people. Lord, in the days of old, they created a temple made by hands, but you said to the, to the man who built that temple, do I live on a place on earth? Then what can contain me? Lord, we don't want you to be contained. We want you to be alive and real to us. Lord, we want you to minister your love and your strength, your desire to us. Lord, we want to go out of here moved and changed by your word and by your spirit this morning. So, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us, that you would move among us, that you would do whatever you desire to do, Lord, because we give it into your hands. And all who agree, say amen. amen. So we've been, we've been starting with this text in this series about divine purpose and the divine authority. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 in the voice, it reads, Remember that God has established our relationship with you in the Anointed One. So in other words, if the anointing is present, or we say it this way, if the presence of God is present, then His relationship with us is being established with us. And also, we are being established with one another. I was hearing the testimony of a pastor that, that uh, he used to pastor a church down in Texas, and he, he said, uh, he, he told another minister, he was telling this testimony about his church. He said that, you know, in, in the years he'd been there for 29 years, he said, we never buried anyone out of illness in 29 years. What a testimony. He said, now we buried folks, but after they got old, their body was wore out, and that's fine, go home and be with the Lord. But he said, and so the younger minister said, well, how did you do that? He said, really, I didn't do anything. I just preached the word of God, and, and I taught my folks. And he said, it just seemed like the people in the church would pick up on things. And somebody would, you know, come under some sort of physical attack. And, and without, you know, and this is before the days of cell phones and all of that. You know, if you wanted to call, you had to pick up and dial the operator. You know, it's that far back. And he said, just people would pick up on it in the spirit, and they'd be, be, begin to pray and and sometimes they'd gather together, you know, a handful of them would gather together and get in somebody's living room and they'd just pray heaven and earth together. He said, we never had anybody get sick for more than three days. I want this church to operate that way. Don't wait for a phone call. 
Don't wait for a message out through Facebook or something like that. Nothing wrong with that as far as that goes. But just, you know, God, I just, you know, I, I just had this sense that brother or sister, you know, well, whoever is it, just needing prayer right now and get a hold of somebody. Come on, we need to pray. We need to get something done here. We need to use the authority that we have in the name of Jesus. We have the authority to bring his healing power into the earth. Amen. So it says, who established our relationship with you in the anointed one. He has anointed and commissioned us for this special mission. And remember, we've been learning that every person is a place for his purpose. Say, I am a place for his purpose. Amen. So, and we learn this, if you'll go to Acts chapter 1, I know this is not in your notes, but God started uh, talking to me on the way, uh, I've had this prepared, I'm like, God, I already got something. <laughs> uh, but, you know, have your way, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So Acts chapter 1, the early church began its mission by demonstration, showing the Father's love. This is Father's Day. Showing the Father's love. So we're going to start with the first verse. It says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to both do and teach until the day which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Isn't it interesting that even the resurrected Jesus Christ gave direction by the Holy Ghost? He didn't operate out of his own authority. He operated out of the same authority that we have, out of the Spirit of God. Amen. So the, it says, verse 3, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So in, in that time that Jesus had between the resurrection and, and his final departure, you know, and then, then he's going to come back someday, but in that time, in those forty days, there was forty days that Jesus met with the apostles, then there's 10 days they were just in the upper room praying, Lord, send whatever that is. Amen. So for 40 days, he was given to them revelation that they could not receive before he died. Are y'all getting this? So he's given them revelation. He's given them things that they didn't even know what it meant before. They, and they couldn't have swallowed it anyway. Listen, sometimes we hear things and God will deposit things into your heart and, and your mind's going, what meaneth this? But God is putting something in your heart, and it's something that He's going, that it's a seed that He's putting in you, and it's going to begin to spring forth and put down roots, and it's going to begin to grow up in you. And then one of these times, God is going to bring enlightenment to, to your mind, and then that thing that He has already grown in you is going to manifest itself, and God is going to be able to do something that He couldn't do before because we didn't know how. So, God, so Jesus is meeting with the boys, and he said, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. Wait for the promise of the Father. A lot of us operate outside of the promise of the Father. We're, we're just going to jump out there and do something. Jesus said, wait, wait till you get something. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then they went off into some other discussion because they still didn't understand some things. But so the church began its mission by demonstration, by showing the Father's love. And they, the reason why they did this was not only because of this thing that we see here in Acts chapter 1, but because they'd walked with the healer for three years. They'd watched him show the love of the Father to people over and over again. And then he also, we saw in Mark chapter 6, we, he also empowered them, and they went out in the power of the Holy Spirit with the blessing of the Father, because you've got to have both. Hello? 
in the power of the Holy Spirit, with the blessing of the Father, because you've got to have both in order to be able to demonstrate the love of God, the Father. So, that when, so when Jesus finally turned the church loose, they knew what to do. The only thing they was waiting for was that flow from heaven. Now, they didn't know what it was, so, but, but Jesus sent them up there. He said, now wait. Don't do anything until you got it. Because a lot of times we, you know, we got a lot of times we have enough information to be dangerous. And not very helpful. Amen. And sometimes, now listen to this. Sometimes we have enough information to kind of know what to do, but we don't have enough strength in the Lord to do it. Jesus said, wait till you have power. Amen. So so to the early church, there was no separation in their minds between the will of God to save and the will of God to heal. It was just all wrapped up in the same bundle. And that's the way it should be. There's no difference in the mind of God between healing and salvation. They're all wrapped up in the same event. Because the Bible says that by his stripes that he took on the way to the cross, we were healed. Amen? So in the mind of God, if in the mind of God there is no difference, there should be no difference in our mind. Is that right? So, so the early church learned from the master himself. They knew their purpose on earth. They weren't waiting for somebody to show them. They were doing it. So now go over to John chapter 10 and verse 30. So in order to demonstrate the love of the Father, we need his spirit working in our lives. And I don't just mean a little bit. We need a bunch. Hello? Now, if you, you know, if you just love God, you know, you can get something done, but let's get a lot done. You know, why, why settle for a bridge in Trenton when you can have a hemi? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that right? Oh, glory to God. John chapter 10, verse 30 says this, I and my Father are one. That should be our testimony also. Hello, I and my Father are one. And, and the reason why Jesus said that is, you know, the religious folks were gathered around him and they're accusing him of operating in the power of the devil. And he said, no, I'm not operating in no demon power. I'm operating in the power of the one who sent me. I'm operating in the power of the Father. I'm operating in the, in, in, in the anointing that he has given to me. Don't accuse me of operating in the power of the devil. And you'll, see, you'll notice this, that people that don't understand the, the things of the Spirit of God will sometimes even accuse us of operating in demonic stuff. Have you ever had that somebody say that to you? I don't know. I've heard that's kind of devilish, you know, that kind of thing. No, no, no. It's not from the devil. The devil ain't going around healing folks. He's going around killing people. This, Jesus said the thief comes but for to kill, to kill and to steal and to destroy. So if one of those three things is happening, that's not God. You know, people will, will pull stuff out of the Old Testament out of context and try to explain something that went wrong out of their own ignorance. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. The Lord's not into taking away. He's into blessing. Amen. If something gets taken from you, it's because you did something and, the devil, and you gave permission to the devil to take it from you. Amen. Or you just didn't know how to stop him. Sometimes we don't even know what's going on. Amen? But as soon as you discover, you need to say, Hey, you thief, you give it back. Send the angels out. Now go, go get it. Bring it back to me. Amen? God wants to help us. And he wants to pour out his help through us. So let's look at this. So the early church, the apostles, the evangelists, the prophets, if we'll go to Acts chapter 6, I know it's not in your notes, but it's, <laughs> I'm just, we got to go here. The early church, the apostles, the evangelists, the prophets, they didn't look for authority, they walked in it. Say, I'm walking in it. They didn't look for it. The reason why they didn't look for it is because in Mark chapter 16, where Jesus you know, was giving his final instructions to the church before he took off, 
He said, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Remember, we looked at that last week. These signs, and, and the very first sign he gave is, is probably the most least likely thing you'll see a believer do, which is very unfortunate. It's the first thing on the list. Not that we need to go around looking for it. you just going to run into it. You don't have to look for it. And you don't want to look for it. The very first thing Jesus said is, in my name they shall cast out devils. The majority of the church is like, uh uh, you do it. Well, fine, I will. I'm not scared of that. One time we were sent up, my wife and I, we were sent up by, by Pastor Virgil, we were sent up to the Indian Reservation, the Navajo Indian Reservation. And, and because of their culture, they invite demons into their presence. With, and they do it ignorantly. They're not doing it on purpose. If they knew better, they wouldn't do it. But one of the things that they do up there is, is, is whenever they leave the reservation and come back, they have to reassign themselves to the spirit of that area. And they get within these mountains, that, you know, the, the, the boundary mountains they call them, the, the spiritual mountains actually is what they call them, and, and, and they reassign themselves to the spirit of that area. Well, what do you think you're doing? That ain't God. So we get in a church, we got in a church service and, and you know, people coming up for healing supposedly, most of them just had devils. Now, I wasn't looking for anything. I don't want to do anything. I really don't like fool with that stuff. I mean, it, I don't care as far as that goes. You know, I have authority over it, but I'm just not running around looking for it. You got a devil? Let me see. Let's catch this thing. You know, I don't do that. But, but you know, I go and lay hands on, I lay hands on the first person. They say, okay, they got healed. You know, they lay hands on the second person. They start, Bleh. you know, and I'm like, oh, come out. And go to the second, third person, and they started manifesting. I'm like, golly, this is unusual even for me, you know. And okay, come out. You know, and I go to the next person, and they're doing. I'm like, wow, it, it just didn't occur to me that you know you get into that place that, that there's going to be a bunch of them. Where 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 my wife and I used to pastor in Bullhead City, you know, they, you got the gambling stuff right across the river from there. Laughlin, Nevada. And, and that invites in all kinds of stuff, too. I mean, it's just, you know, there's all that stuff. I remember one day we come home from church, and, and somebody, some lady had stood up, stood up in the service at the back of the church and yelled at me, Satan lives! I'm like, oh boy, this is not what I had planned for today. <laughs> you know? And so we get home, and we're, we're sitting there, and she, she sits on the couch, and she's, and she's got tears in her eyes. Can't we just have normal people? <laughs> well, they become more normal once we cast the devil out of them. <laughs> oh, man. So I, in, in pre preparing this morning, God showed me, he said to me, this is the greatest sermon in the Bible. I was going to start in Acts chapter 8, you know, about Philip going down to Samaria and and, and, you know, the great joy in the city and all that. But, but you know, you got to back up a little bit, find out where did, Philip, where did Philip come from. Philip was one of the original deacons. A deacon is not somebody that sits on a board and gives the pastor a hard time. Amen. According to the instructions that the apostles gave for the first deacons, Really, a deacon's just an usher, as far as if you look, if you study it out a little bit. It's just, you know, somebody got that to him, and a deacon is an usher. Full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. You assign these guys to the duty, okay? So they, they get going here for a little bit, and then one of these guys discovers that, hey, I can do more than just hand out food to people. God is calling of us, calling all of us to get out of the natural and get over into the supernatural. I mean, thank God for what we can do in the natural, but feeding feeding people are not going to get them healed. Come on now, or saved. Now it can help lead them in that direction, but you understand what I'm saying. So it says, verse 8, chapter 6, verse 8 says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Wait a minute. And can you can see, you can see modern church folk going, Hey, you're the usher, sit down. Verse 
right? You're the usher. Sit down. You're not supposed to be. That's for, that, you know, the apostles are supposed to be doing that. Well, Peter, Stephen didn't listen to them. It says, and there arose from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. In other words, these guys go up and they're trying to mess up his deal. He's preaching to people and, and ministering to people. And they get up there and they start arguing with him, you know, like that lady in the back of the church. Satan lives. That's what they're operating in. Now, they weren't saying Satan lives, but that's what they're operating in. Let me say that again. They, weren't oper they were operating in that. Amen. Anybody that gets the idea that in their head that I need to overthrow the pastor, you're operating in that spirit. Come on now. If he's doing some things that are a little bit, maybe you think they're out of kilter, pray for him. Don't have the time to tell, tell the story of D.L. Moody, but when, when he first took over a church, he was a young guy, you know, wet behind the ears, took over the first church and proceeded to run everybody off. Just because he's inexperienced, didn't know what he was doing. But, but those deacons that he had in his church, there was 12 of those men, they sat down and they, gave, they told him one by one what he was doing wrong, and they said, this is what we've decided to do. We're going to pray for you until you become the man of God God wants you to be. Hallelujah. If it wasn't for him, we'd never heard of D.L. Moody. Amen. So they could not resist, and, they, and then they secretly introduced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God, which was just a flat-out lie. People that operate in this kind of thing are going to lie right to your face. And it will surprise you at first if you don't know what's going on. You'll be like, wait a minute. I'm just trying to serve Jesus. I'm not lying. And... Right? And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. They weren't satisfied with just getting a few folks to lie about them. They're going to get everybody involved in this deal. So they stirred up the, the elders and the scribes and they came upon him and seized him and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses said, who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and against the law. Another lie. He wasn't saying nothing against it. He was telling them how God had completed the process. Amen. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council looked steadfastly steadfastly at him and saw his face as the face of an angel. Now they weren't thinking of him as being angelic. But they could see the power of God on his face. And they said, okay, we've done lied and said all up. Now we're going to be quiet because God's here. Amen. God is going to teach you how to let God be here. Then the high priest said, Are these things so? Now this is the greatest sermon in the Bible. Some of you think it's the Sermon on the Mount. That, that's only a part of a sermon. This is the whole thing. This is the greatest sermon in the Bible. You'll find out why. Because you're going to see the love of the Father in this. Come on now. He said, brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. And he said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, but even enough to set his foot on, but even, when, but even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give him for possession and to his descendants after him. So he's preaching God's purpose. He's preaching the purpose of the Father in, in the earth. Is that right? You can already begin to see this, right? He's preaching the purpose of the Father in the earth. But God spoke in this way. 
that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land that the, and, and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage I will judge, said God. And after that they shall come out and serve me in this place. Then he gave to him the covenant of the circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. So he's saying, okay, here's the story of God. This is what it means to the earth. On the, he's starting off in the beginning. The first covenant that God made with man was with Abraham, right? And he's going to bring this covenant up to the modern day time. Because by the time he gets, we get to the end of this sermon, we're in today even though he preached it 2,000 years ago. Amen? It says, And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. Woo-hoo! devil's always trying to get rid of you, but God is with you. God, it may see, the devil might take you and put you on the back burner for a while because you haven't learned how to overcome him. But he's going to get, but God will, if you stay faithful, God will get you off that back burner and put you on the front, and people are going to come and watch you burn. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt. He's saying, why are you reading the whole thing? Because it's important. Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt, and Canaan and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers first. And the second time Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and called for his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt and he died, he and our fathers. And they, carried, and they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. Families are important to God. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt until another king arose who did not know Joseph. And this man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they they may not live. Now, you know that's modern time. We're living in a land and a place where our babies may not live. And it's a heinous thing. I said it. You know, Ireland just got rid of protection for babies. And now they're telling the church over there, and you can't do it either. You know what God told to me? He said, you think the British were hard on them the last time. You wait to see what's coming now. Well, that's not the grace of God. They can repent. But God always has to send out warning. We can get ourselves back out of trouble, but he has to tell us. You know, if you're headed for a bridge that's out, God will tell you, stop, turn around. Sometimes we just proceed. Amen? And at this time, Moses was born, and it was, and it was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in word and deed. And when he was 40 years old, it came to his heart to visit his brethren and children of Israel. He come out there in the flesh. 80% of the church operates in the flesh. And they go out and kill Egyptians. You know, with the protesting and all the stuff. Yeah, we don't like this and we don't like that. Instead of demonstrating the love of the Father. No spirit. Come on now. I hope you're getting this.
And seeing one of them suffer wrong, verse 24, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian, for he supposed his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. People never understand. Do it anyway. Amen. They'll figure it out sooner or later, especially when God starts helping them. Amen. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? Hmm. But he did. But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Did you want me? Did you do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Flesh will always produce flesh, and you cannot overcome that. You're going to get in a fight, and you ain't going to like what happens. Smile. Then, at this same, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, and he had two sons, and when 40 years had passed, 40 years, think about that. Now, this is something I want you to understand. The Moses in the movies is not the Moses of the Bible. In every movie I've ever seen about Moses, you know, and thank God there's at least something getting out there, but, but every movie, movie I've seen about Moses, he's always surprised when, when God shows up in the bush. You get over in the New Testament, it says that he was attracted to it. That's why he looked. Amen. And forty years had passed, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the, Mount of, uh, in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. And when Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. He wasn't scared. He was like, ooh, what's that? I'm going to go find out. See, th there's, there's two kinds of believers. There's the ones that run from the fire, and there's the ones that run to. Which are you? Run to or run away? You run away, you ain't going to get to see what God's going to do. You run too. Now, you understand something. Whenever we get in the presence of God, there's always, it's always a little bit scary. Let's be honest about it. Because there's an element of the unknown. We don't know exactly what's going to occur or what's going to happen. And, and just the presence alone, you know, is, is a, little bit, a little bit frightening. You know, that's why God always has to say, don't fear. <laughs> Right? Because, because the presence of God is just so awesome, you get like, hmm. It's overwhelming. But it says that he marveled at the sight, and as he drew near to observe, see, he wasn't running away. He was like, I want to get closer and see what this is. When God shows up in our services, we should rush the front. Instead of sit back and watch and see what's going to happen. Nothing. If we do that. Amen? As he drew no 